Rory, thank you so much for being here. Do you want to kick off? Yeah. Well, th thank you all very much indeed. Um, and I think JD's going to mute, mute you for a second, if that's all. Great, and I'll mute you. Um, I hope you can hear me. Please lift your hands up in the air if you can hear me. Great, fantastic. Thank you. All right. Um, so it's uh, lovely to see you. I'm sorry I'm I'm not with you in person. I'm I've just got back from Jordan, and I'm actually uh, in Scotland with my children. So I'm I'm sorry I'm not with you. Uh, I wanted to talk very briefly, but then I think probably most usefully have a conversation and proper questions and a proper exchange. And I, I think with this. Zoom format and being able to see you, I think we may be able to do more of a conversation. Uh, and I, I'm looking forward to that very much. I'm going to begin with a few framing references and questions. And a lot of what I say needs to be taken with a pinch of salt, because the truth of the matter is that international development as a field, which has existed in a pretty formal state since the Second World War, so for more than 70 years, has frequently made great claims and great promises and frequently failed to deliver. And anybody who thinks they have absolute or clear answers, particularly to the question of how you address extreme poverty globally, uh, is probably partially deluding themselves. So I think there's an enormous amount of humility that's required in any conversation around international development and extreme poverty. What I'm going to do is try to share my own experience, and I'll begin by talking a little bit about my own experience of working in international development, and then reflect a little bit on the development of cash as a solution to extreme poverty, some of its achievements, some of the questions, and then engage with all of you on almost anything you want to talk about, whether it's questions of faith, questions of effects of altruism, or questions of efficacy in international development. Begin with the first. I have been working in and around the field of international development, I suppose, for 30 years. And I have seen it from many, many different directions. I saw it as a young diplomat in Indonesia, I saw it from the point of view of the first attempts in the 1990s to get involved in state building when I was serving in the Balkans in Montenegro, working on Bosnia and Kosovo. I saw it walking. I spent two years walking across Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India and Nepal, which was a very important moment for me. From 2000 to 2002, I walked 25, 30 miles a day. I stayed in 550 village houses along the route, and every night I stayed in a different village home, talking to villagers about their lives, about their landscape, about their government, and about their livelihoods. I then returned to Iraq, where I was posted as the governor of two provinces in the Marsh Arab regions, southern Iraq, where I was responsible for implementing a very, very wide range of projects from clinics and school construction through to elections and governance reform. I then moved to Afghanistan where I set up a nonprofit, which a charity which worked in the center of the old city of Kabul, restoring the center of the old city, restoring historic buildings, bringing in water supply, sanitation, electricity, again, a clinic, again, primary schools, uh, an institute for training traditional artisans. And we began working with traditional artisans to manufacture and export their products to the world and then bring the money back to that community in Afghanistan. I then went into politics and I did various things, but amongst those things, I was the minister for development in the Middle East and Asia. I was then the Minister for Africa. I was then the prisons minister, so I was responsible for prisons. And that's something also I'd be very happy to talk about if people are interested in talking about prisons. I was responsible for running the prison system in England and Wales. And then I was the Secretary of State for International Development. I ran against Boris to be Prime Minister. I was obviously defeated. And then I moved to Yale University. And then I joined Give Directly. And 
I suppose the the what I would try to share is how very strange conventional international development is as a field, by which I mean working for the DFIDs or FCDOs of the world, or the World Bank or UN agencies or the big charities, Save the Children, Mercy Corps, Care, World Vision, people who implement these multi hundred million dollar projects often contracted by governments or multilateral organizations to deliver. And I think there are a number of problems with the current issue, which you will be aware of, but I think the impact of it is difficult to really understand unless you have been on the ground. So let me try to give a couple of examples that shocked me, particularly when I was a minister. One was being briefed on a project in rural Zambia based on water and sanitation. And it began with a very, very beautiful presentation about a theory of change and a deep need. And in this case, the theory of change was that if it was possible to provide water and sanitation to young women in schools, uh, particularly when they had periods, it would allow them to remain in school longer, possibly even extend their education by five or seven years and make a huge difference to their future life prospects, both through saving them from early child marriage, but also through the way the education would increase their opportunity of, of income and independence in later life. And I think the first point I'd want to make is how often in international development, the justification, the theory of change is frequently compelling. That isn't usually the problem. You'll find any number of charities out there. And there are an enormous number of charities. I, I discovered when I was working in the prison system that there are no less than 15,000 charities in England and Wales working on prisons alone. So that's 15,000 just focused on prisons. But every single charity you can imagine has a beautiful idea. And there will be a very, very compelling story about what they are providing and why it is essential to recipients to provide. The problem lies in implementation. And in particular, the extraordinary lack of impact that very large sums of money can have. So to take the Zambian example further, I traveled to Zambia, found myself in a rural village visiting a school and hearing that DFID, the Department for International Development, had given $42,000 to this school for a water and sanitation project but it had done so by bypassing it through a UN agency. And all the big UN cars were there and the UN engineers were there. And they took me to see the project and the entire project, the entire results of the project consisted of two holes in the ground with a small brick building around them, which served as latrines and five red plastic buckets hanging on hooks. And when I said, what's going on with the buckets, the engineers said, well, we've analyzed this school and we've decided that it would be inappropriate to run pipes because there are maintenance issues with pipes. So the children are taking the buckets to the well 200 yards away, filling the water up in the well, and then they bring the buckets back here and then they wash their hands. Total cost of buckets, maybe $4. Total cost of latrines, $2,000. Total cost of project, $42,000. So I said, why don't you just give $3,000 to the head teacher and let him do this? And the answer was, well, we're worried that he would steal the money. Forcing me to sort of restrain myself from asking whether uh, the UN engineers and the implementing partners hadn't effectively themselves stolen $40,000 in the process of implementing this project. Now, I, I begin with that slightly stark example, but what I discovered, and I must have visited many, many hundreds of development projects in probably 45 countries over 30 years, is that that is surprisingly typical. And that is partly because of the very odd attitude 
that we take on board when we engage uh, with people, particularly people living in extreme poverty. And I want to maybe frame that by talking a little bit about cash as a way of illustrating the other extreme. So clearly what Give Directly does is to directly deliver cash as efficiently and as cheaply as we can to recipients, to the extreme poor, and to then allow them to decide how to spend that money. Why is that so radical? Why do we find that so difficult psychologically to endorse? Why is that not the way that we've done international development for the last 70 years, or indeed its previous examples for the last couple of hundred years? And I think there are five things that strike me about these psychological obstacles to addressing people directly in that way. One is that many of us were brought up to believe that you shouldn't give someone a fish, you should teach them how to fish. This is what I would call the capacity building myth. The idea is that the extreme poor are somehow ignorant and that fundamentally what they're lacking is knowledge and that the best thing we can give them is training or knowledge. Now, the problem with this idea that you shouldn't give them a fish, you should teach them how to fish, is that they may already know how to fish, but simply not have the money to buy a fishing hook. Or perhaps more relevantly, they may not want to fish. They may want to set up a tailoring shop or an internet cafe or send their children to school or fix their roof. So there are two problems with the capacity building model. It presumes that the recipient lacks knowledge, and it also narrowly focuses on training people in one particular thing, which they may not actually want to know, may not be a priority for them. The, the second problem, I think, with traditional development models is, and this is particularly true for very wealthy people, is a problem of vanity. People who are very wealthy don't want to feel that they are just giving their money, that they feel it cheapens them to just give their money. They want to feel that they're giving their ideas, and they will frequently say, I'm a very successful business person. I've made all this money with my business. I shouldn't just be giving my money. I should be bringing all my business skills to bear on this village, as though they were some sort of McKinsey consultant being parachuted into a small hamlet on the Rwanda-Burundi border and proceeding to do a PowerPoint presentation for the villagers on how to sort out their lives. Right? Now, this is mad in a number of ways. One way is that the extreme poor in a hamlet on the Rwanda-Burundi border live lives that are very, very difficult for any of us to imagine, perhaps even more difficult for an ultra high net worth individual, for a billionaire to imagine. Their priorities, their beliefs, their daily lives, their daily rituals, their daily needs are deeply, deeply alien to most of us. We face barriers of culture. We face barriers of language. We face barriers of class. We face barriers of wealth. We face barriers of geography. And all of those things mean that we are encountering something that is radically alien. And it's very, very uh, dangerous to believe that from a distance, we can determine what is in the best interests of other people. And many, many of the failures of development that I've observed result from this problem. And often things go wrong in ways that are quite difficult to envisage, that are quite um, surprising. Often cultural beliefs, cultural habits, will end up in very, very odd uh, results. You know, I, I've seen people using malaria nets as fishing nets, for example. I've seen people refusing to use latrines because they believed they are, uh, well, because they believe that they are religious buildings. 
I've seen people refusing to clean solar panels. Um, I've seen people deliberately blocking up sewage pipes. Understanding why these things happen is difficult and is to do an enormous amount with problems of trust and understanding at a local level. But it does mean that many, many well-intentioned projects, even quite simple engineering projects, will go awry because the local community doesn't believe in them and hasn't bought into them. The problem of vanity of the wealthy manifests itself, though, no, not just in a problem of ignorance or lack of knowledge. It manifests itself also in a desire to show off to their friends by saying, I haven't just given money, I've invented somebody, something that nobody's ever thought of before. I've invented a seesaw, which when children sit on it also operates as a water pump. Or I've been the first person to notice that if you give someone a chicken, that chicken has eggs and that eggs have more chickens, right? I have some extraordinary revolutionary insight that I can share with the world. And that that's that actually is not, uh, you know, I'm obviously using it as a joke, but it's actually what Bill Gates did. He sent chickens in very, very large numbers to uh, Mauritania and Senegal. Uh, and in doing so, actually offended the people in that country. I mean, the president of the country, when Bill Gates explained to him laboriously that chickens had eggs and eggs had more chickens, um, uh, felt that it was necessary to point out to Bill Gates that that villagers are more aware than Bill Gates of the reality of chicken farming. Uh, um, the next thing I think is that there's a huge amount of vested interest. The development agencies, the charities employ an enormous number of people who are understandably very proud of their master's degrees in international development, of their expertise, in agriculture or health or education. And it's very, very troubling to them to confront a project which says, we don't need you, we're just gonna give cash directly to villagers and they're gonna fix their own affairs. It calls into question very profoundly the way that they've been operating for 40 or 50 years. It's deeply, deeply threatening to the identity of individuals uh, and to institutions. The next problem, is that a lot of money that goes into international development comes from governments, and the governments get their money from taxpayers and voters. And again, taxpayers and voters have very particular ideas on what they think charity or international development is. In the case of the United States, the most extreme example is farmers in Idaho want to offload their corn on the extreme poor, and an enormous amount of money is spent shipping corn from Idaho to South Sudan and it arrives and the local people don't want to eat corn and they sell the corn to get cash to buy what they need and the whole thing is incredibly wasteful. Or voters will not be confident with the idea of giving cash to people. They will feel that it will be stolen. They feel that uh, they're signing up to exporting the dole. They feel that 20 pounds their own money is going into 20 pounds of somebody else's money on the other side of the world. And they themselves are falling into these don't give someone a fish, teach someone to, to fish models. And then I think the final thing is a very, very deep set of psychological barriers that we all carry around cash. The sort of questions you immediately ask about cash, is it sustainable? What happens if it gets stolen? What happens if it's spent on the wrong thing? Are questions that you can ask about in-kind development assistance as well. If you give someone a bag of wheat, you can also ask what happens if it's stolen? What happens if the wheat is sold and the cash is used to buy the wrong thing? Is it sustainable? But for some reason, we don't ask those questions much about giving someone a bag of wheat. Uh, we feel it more viscerally with cash. There's something about cash that, that worries us. And I think it's something that many of us in the room may also feel, which is that cash can feel very, very materialistic. It can feel very coarse as though you're reducing people to very um, numerical, quantitative uh, dimensions. And I think it's important 
therefore to understand cash as a means to an end, not an end in itself, that you should think about cash as the cow or the shelter or the child's education or the nutrition, the food on the table, the small business that's emerging. You should see the cash as the opportunity, the freedom that's been delivered to an individual. And I think above all, the dignity that's been delivered to an individual. I think what makes cash quite different from any other intervention, including some very well-documented, powerful, effective altruist interventions, is that cash is unique in its trust of recipients, unique in giving them dignity, giving them autonomy, giving them agency. Now, to, to conclude and then go on to questions, we face a very odd moment. There's a lot of rhetorical optimism about extreme poverty. It's true that 800 million people have been lifted out of extreme poverty in China, and therefore the number of people living in extreme poverty in the world as a percentage of the global population has decreased significantly since 1980. But in Africa, the number of people living in extreme poverty in 1980 was 170 million people. Today, the number is 470 million. And it is very important, respectfully, to understand what extreme poverty means, just how life constricting it is to live in a single mudroom building, to struggle to put one meal a day on your family's uh, floor to have no savings, no resilience, to be so vulnerable to a single drought that it can literally kill you, to deal with the fact that your children are malnourished and suffering from cognitive problems, that you can't get them into school, that any health emergency is almost impossible to deal with, and that you have no real possibility of developing any savings or investments to lift yourself out of that condition of extreme poverty, and that generally speaking, the extreme poor are not happy. It's not a fulfilling life. It's a, a life which is immensely stressful. It's a life often correlated with domestic violence. It's a life correlated with a very, very profound narrowing of your sense of possibilities and opportunities. And yet the world is turning away from extreme poverty. Many people are more interested now in climate or the environment. And that often means putting money into middle income countries like Indonesia, because they're the people that are emitting the carbon, rather than giving money to places like Somalia, which is suffering from the drought caused by that climate change. Many other people are interested in trying to chase efficiency on vaccination because what they're interested in is life expectancy or infant mortality. So there's been a huge investment in global health outcomes. But delivering the prosperity to people to allow them with dignity to address their own multidimensional needs um, remains something which I think has faded in terms of people's priorities. I believe that cash can be an incredibly important part of demonstrating how one could lift communities out of extreme poverty, that we have the capacity, all of us in this room, to demonstrate this at the level of an individual family. And I think there's almost nothing I find more sort of directly fulfilling and efficient than the way in which $550 delivered to a single family can literally transform their economic conditions and can do so in a way where you can still measure the impact against a control group many, many years later. But even more excitingly, as we group together at scale, I think we have an opportunity for an extraordinary return, which is to change the minds of the governments and the UN agencies who are spending $170 billion a year and who are committed to ending extreme poverty, but don't really have any recipe for doing it. And I think if we can demonstrate at a national scale, maybe a small country like Rwanda or Malawi, that we could 
make a real difference to lifting everybody in that country out of extreme poverty, or at least significantly reducing the number of people in extreme poverty in that country through cash. I think we have a model that could be profoundly exportable and where the money spent has the extraordinary return of leveraging in those hundreds of billions that will be spent over the next decade in overseas development assistance. I'm going to end there. I'm uh, also going to close that shutter in front of me, which is putting a strange bolt of light into my eye, and then I'm going to take questions from you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Fantastic, Roy. I'm not sure if you can hear us, but I think uh, I hope you heard the, the applause and we're very grateful for your talk. <laughs> you might even have an extra member of the of the audience behind you as well. It's my, my mother came in, but I think she's exited oh, again. She's honestly very welcome if she wants Thank to join us. <laughs> I'll I'll tell her that she's welcome. One second. I'll tell her. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're very welcome. If you want to... Very funny if you want to sit quietly and listen. <laughs> Perfect. As a reminder to the people in the room, um, we have a Slido going, so I can see that there's a lot of questions already gone in there, including, to give you a heads up, Roy, there's some, there's some real tough ones in here for you. So I hope you're prepared for anything that we uh, might Good. throw. At Ready you. for you. Um, I'll kick off with the first one at the top. Um, what kind of activities should uh, UK FCDO, so that's the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, civil servants in development-facing roles focus on institutionally in order to make the biggest difference. So essentially, UK civil servants, how can they make a difference to, to move things in the right way? I, I mean, I think one of the biggest tasks facing a civil servant is, in a broad sense, educational. It's explaining to politicians, to voters, to multilateral institutions, so the UN agencies and others, what's gone wrong in development and what the evidence suggests a better approach should be. And that requires a remarkable degree of self-reflection and humility. It requires being honest about the fact that many of the things that we continue to do don't work and finding a way of explaining that rather difficult, sometimes implausible message to other people. So I think the, the real thing I'd ask for for a civil servant is to really develop the deep understanding of the problems of implementation in the field, a deep understanding of the development literature, and then the skills to be able to communicate it to people who don't have that understanding, because a civil servant is right at the nexus of interaction between the field and the public and the politicians who are not specialists and who continue to inherit some very peculiar and often outdated visions of um of international development thank you that's that's really helpful um next question is obviously um You've never been sort of uh, shy about saying that you're a Christian, but I guess you've not spoken hugely about this in, in public. Um, uh, the question is uh, why you've not spoken more. Um, I, I think I, I am shy about it, and I'm still working out how to do it and how to do it usefully. And I think that's partly because I remain shy and uncertain as a Christian, and I think Developing confidence in my faith is part of developing confidence in talking about it. Um, my experiences are, well, so much of my religious experience is either, I think too, too much still is, is connected with periods of silent retreats or periods in church or periods of reading. Um, and I haven't quite worked out how to integrate it more strongly into my um, my charitable life. I mean, I, I 
so I think on on that side, I think I, I I could do with learning more from you rather than actually talking at you. That's a very uh, generous way to end it. I think it's probably I could probably speak for the room that I think everyone always has the same niggles, and I think we've probably uh, all of us shied away from sharing our faith in the past. So we'll we'll let you know if we have any wisdom, but and please let us know if you think of anything as well. Um, Move on nextly to think about sort of the effect of altruism movement, which obviously you're familiar with, but probably you've sort of come into a bit more recently. And I'm not sure if you'd necessarily label yourself as part of the movement, but you're certainly very involved with it. What what, what are your impressions of the effect of altruism movement overall, and what what should we be doing differently? Well, I, I think the fundamental idea is a is a is a very very exciting and brilliant one, and I think it's it's revolutionary to have a movement that really makes people focus on what the impact really is and how much it costs and what sort of return you're getting for your money. I think it's a very, very useful route through. Because I think so many things fail to meet that bar in the most extreme and catastrophic ways. I mean, there's a Congress just did a study on USAID programs in Afghanistan, and they looked at a particular program on women's empowerment, which was a $130 million program, and they concluded that it may have improved the economic conditions of 52 women. And even that, they couldn't be sure. That was $130 million. So I, I think the, the fundamental insight, if that is the insight underlying the A movement, that an enormous amount of what passes for international development is crazy beyond belief. Uh, let, let me explain how, how these things go wrong, because I think this is important. <laughs> I think one of the things that I do sometimes notice, it depends where you come from as somebody in effective altruism. Not everybody in EA has worked in international development, and not everybody in EA is actually very interested in going on the ground and seeing development projects. So I have these slightly odd conversations often in New York with people who are incredibly generous to us but could not be less interested in actually going and seeing villages in Africa or seeing the extreme poor. And I find that difficult to sort of compute in my head because I'm, uh, I do think that in the end, um, it's difficult for me to understand what we're doing, except in terms ultimately of direct empathy for another human or another group of humans. And I also think that it's dangerous to rely too much on spreadsheets because they can conceal things. Um, I also think that you're missing out on a loss of the the richness and reality and the fulfillment of what you're doing if you don't actually visit the recipients and see see what's actually happening because you might have an an unrealistic idea of the conditions in which people live you might have an unrealistic idea of what change you're really bringing to their lives i mean you you i think it it is worth seeing those things um what's my anxiety about it. I guess my anxiety about it is that and I, and I felt this a little bit when we had a strange conversation with Givewell about Give Directly, which was based on you know, modeling which suggested that um, money spent on certain kinds of vaccination or malaria treatment had a better return on investment than giving cash to the extreme poor to determine their future. Um, I think the problem there, and this is something I think Peter Singer would agree with, is that it's very difficult to objectively or be mathematically confident about how to weigh life expectancy and mortality against improvement in somebody's daily life. So let, let me put it in very brutal terms. One of the projects which was being supported at the time, I believe, involved 
a charity receiving $70 per individual matched by the vaccine alliance giving about another $60 per individual. So each individual child, the cost was about $130 to get them vaccinated. So if you think about our typical program, which involves delivering $600 to a household, you are either spending that $600 getting the five people in that household vaccinated and nothing else, right? They're just vaccinated. Or you are allowing them to use that money to fix their roof, to buy a cowl, to get their children in school, to get a mattress on their floor, to improve their drinking water, to building up their savings and investment and income, to improve nutrition for their children, I am not confident that there is a mathematical formula that allows you to determine which is the better choice. And there is part of me that thinks that there is an unquantifiable value in trusting people and giving them the dignity to choose how they want to spend that money rather than an outsider deciding it's better for you to be vaccinated than spend the money on feeding yourself or putting your kids in school. Um, so I think there are there's a sort of limit to it. Um, that said, I think it is the most incredibly powerful discipline which we must subject international development to. And I think if what it does is remind us again and again of how often projects have zero impact. I mean, this is what our randomized control tests and benchmarking studies are showing. We have benchmarked against nutrition studies and youth business programs, which have literally had zero impact. People spending $3 million on nutrition training and there's no improvement in nutrition. $3 million on youth business training, no creation of businesses. $3 million on education enrollment, no increase in education enrollment. Um, so I think, Th there, I think EA is incredibly powerful in bringing that sense of discipline. I just think there's a limit to it. I don't think it's a. I don't think it's an absolute. Well, that's great, and I guess there's a related question here as well, which is, you know, what can we as as EAs, and in particular in this room, Christian EAs, do to uh, influence actually international aid budgets um, in addition to our own giving? You know, would you recommend people shift careers, and if so, what would you recommend people do, or how would how do you use that influence? Well, I think if you're passionate about um, passionate about international development, and if you're passionate about poverty, and I think I would imagine most people in this room care about the poor, I would hope, and would want their lives to be improved and transformed, then I think there is an obligation incumbent on us to work out what we can do to be helpful. Um, and that's largely, I think, about self-understanding, understanding your own skill set uh, and where you can, and it requires an enormous amount of humility and realism about where you can make a difference. And there won't be any mathematical answer to it either, because I think it also, I think there should be room for the human. There should be room for people acknowledging there are certain things that they enjoy and may do better because they enjoy them. Uh, so I would say though, be aware of the range of possibilities, be aware that there is the working with the gift directly to this world. There is doing other jobs and sending money to charities. There is influencing public policy and making sure that the Labour Party uh, thinks more systematically about international development. There's influencing the views of voters. There's everything that's involved in policy and advocacy, promoting campaigns amongst the population as a whole, promoting campaigns amongst parliamentarians and civil servants and UN agencies. And again, I don't think there's a, a formula that allows you to know exactly what the return is on all these things. I think you need to experiment and get a sense of where you feel you're making progress, where you feel that you've got traction, what you enjoy, 
uh, rather than imagining this I or any book can tell you which of those paths you want to pursue. That makes sense. That's really helpful. Um, the next most, and probably the, quite a random order, but the next most popular one is, does the concept of give directly apply to the homelessness issue in the UK? And I know that you've, uh, perhaps you might want to speak about the sort of the give directly's work in the US on that as well. I, I'm a little bit more skeptical about the impact of cash in the developed world. And here are some reasons why. One is that the extreme poor on the Rwanda-Burundi border are starting from such a low base that a very small amount of money can totally transform their lives. $600 delivered to a woman in Rwanda could be her very first electricity, her first chance to get more than a meal a day, her first chance to get her children's school, her first mattress, her first roof, her first chance to build up a tiny amount of savings, her first bicycle. Um, none of those things are true for the extreme poor in the developed world. They are surrounded by much more developed public infrastructure they have generally. Uh, most people have access to electricity, to schooling, to healthcare. You can't make that kind of difference in someone's life. Secondly, because of the cost of living and purchasing power parity, to have the impact that you can have with $550 uh, in Africa, you would have to spend $55,000, you know, 100 times as much in the United States. Then I would also say that the governments in the developed world are much wealthier. There's no reason why the US government, which is, you know, the US is the wealthiest country on earth, should not be running a decent welfare state and be providing for people. You can't make that kind of demand of the government of Malawi. And then again, the extreme poor in Britain. I mean, let's take your, your question, which was about the homeless. What's holding them back is often not only access to cash. It will be the fact that a very high percentage of them have been in care, a very high percentage have been excluded from school, a very high percentage of them have literacy issues, a very high percentage have mental health challenges, a very high percentage have addiction challenges. Whereas if you're dealing with a typical village on the Rwanda-Burundi border, most people in that community, are simply what's holding them back is lack of access to money. They don't have the full complex of problems. Finally, our societies in Britain and the United States are much denser and more difficult to navigate through. There are fewer economic opportunities for people. There's less surplus supply and demand available when the cash becomes available. So it becomes much more difficult to turn someone's life around. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. I, I sometimes feel that by working in Africa, I'm taking the easier path. And I feel even more admiration for people who work with the poor in Britain, because it is much, much more difficult, much more time consuming, much more costly to change an individual life. And I think people who do that deserve enormous uh, admiration. And I think it, it again, it's maybe says something more about my personality than it does about the, the need that I focus on Africa. Great. I, I think we've got about five minutes left, if that, if that works for you, Rory. Uh, so if we will fit in a couple more questions. Um, this one is, how do you balance your own ambitious expectations with biblical reminders of human fragility? Uh, and the person here has quoted Psalm 103, which says, we are but dust, like grass, like flowers. I promise no easy questions. Yeah, well, that, that's a particularly tough one. Um, I don't think there's any um, adequate answer to that, because both things are true. Uh, we are like dust and grass and flowers. We are immensely fragile. Our lives are very, very, very short. Uh, and at the same time, our lives are deeply meaningful. And what we do in this world um, matters profoundly at the same time that on an entirely different level, uh, it's infinitesimal compared to God.
but I, I think there's no reason why you can't hold those two things and again I'm I'm shy in this audience but it may be somebody more qualified than me would suggest that that's what the the message of the incarnation is it, it, it's through the person of Jesus that one resolves the paradox um, that's been pointed to in that question. Thank you. And to, uh, to close off with a question, uh, obviously I'm sure you're familiar that EA has many different cause areas, not just global poverty. This one says, um, should we try and improve the lives of animals suffering on intensive farms, uh, given there are billions just in the UK alone? And if so, how would you think about weighing that against global poverty alleviation? Oh, I think it's, I th listen, I think all forms of human love and empathy and care, whether for the poor or for the suffering of, of animals, it is to be valued and respected. I think, you know, I, I remember visiting battery chicken factories in my constituency and being completely horrified by the lives of those animals and feeling that it was fundamentally appalling uncivilized that we should live in a society that's that subjected sentient creatures to that kind of existence um so i i remain very very open to the idea of deep different people finding different causes different priorities I, I don't I wouldn't want to rank them. Um, I, 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 I get my most profound satisfaction working with the extreme poor in Africa. But that may say something more about me than about uh, a relative um, calculation of relative values. Thank you all very, very much indeed. Thank you so much, Rory. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye. Thank you.